So we've already learned first off thermodynamics that says energy is conserved, but it can be converted from one form to another form. We've also seen that in thermodynamics often define the universe as being composed of a system plus the surroundings. The only thing that can be transferred between the system and surroundings is heat and work. The beaker where you're doing your reaction can be considered the system. We've also seen that the change in enthalpy is equal to Q, heat transferred to the system, assuming only expansion work and constant pressure. We've also seen that during endothermic processes, heat is transferred from the surroundings to the system. During exothermic processes, heat is transferred from the system to the surroundings. And so we had defined our change enthalpy by using this Daryl derivation. On top, we start with delta U equals Q plus W, a statement in the first law of thermodynamics. If we assume only expansion or work, and constant pressure and solve for Q, we get Q is equal to delta U plus P delta V. Again, this is very important. Q is a path function, but with our assumption, we can actually see that it's equal to the sum of two state functions. And so we can treat it as a state function. So important enough that we'll define Q as equal to delta H when you have constant pressure and assuming no expansion work. Now in this video, we'll talk about standard enthalpies of formation. And so in using standard enthalpies of formation, we can actually calculate how much heat is absorbed by the system or transferred from the system to the surroundings. We can also determine whether or not a reaction is exothermic or endothermic. And so standard enthalpies of formation are fairly important. What you should be able to do after watching this video is describe what standard conditions are, describe how, how and why enthalpies are defined relative to the elements in their standard state. And again, this is fairly important. Enthalpies cannot be determined in absolute terms, and so what we do is we define elements in their standard state as having zero enthalpies of formation. You should be able to recognize elements in their standard state. Using standard enthalpies, identify which reactions are exothermic and which reactions are endothermic. Using standard enthalpies, you should be able to calculate how much heat is consumed or produced by a reaction. And so standard enthalpies, they're measured under standard conditions, which means one bar, concentrations one mole per liter, temperatures usually at 25 degrees Celsius. And so often we'll see these tables of compounds with enthalpies of formation. These are all measured numbers. And so you do the reaction forming the one mole of the compound from elements in their standard state, and you measure how much heat is transferred to the system or from systems to the surroundings during that reaction. Now you have to be able to recognize elements in their standard state. And so the elements in, in blue are actually elements in their standard state. They're defined as having zero enthalpies of formation. Elements in their standard state are the most stable phase for that element under nominal conditions. And so if we think about hydrogen, typically find as hydrogen gas, H2, and so that's the element in standard state. Hydrogen gas, H, is not. Helium gas, element in standard state. Lithium, we find as solid metal. Nitrogen gas, N2, element in standard state. And so when you're thinking about elements in a standard state, the formula matters. Again, H2 is element standard state. It's the most stable form of hydrogen under nominal conditions. Hydrogen H is not. O2, most stable form of oxygen under, under standard conditions. O3 is not. And so O2 is element in standard state. Phase matters. So bromine is one of the few elements that actually is stable in the liquid form. And so Br2 liquid, element standard state. Br2 gas, not. Calcium solid, element center state, calcium gas, not. The structure of solid matters. And so carbon graphite is actually more stable than carbon diamond. And so carbon graphite is the element center state. Rhombic monoclinic are just two solid structures for sulfur. The rhombic is more stable, and so is the element in standard state. And so you should recognize these. The column on the left are some common gases you should recognize, H2, N2, O2, F2, chlorine, um, bromine liquid, and iodine solid, all elements in their standard state. You should recognize on the right, we have the noble gases. Solids, just are the metal elements, are just solids, elements in their state. And so if we want to determine enthalpy formation for ammonia, what we have to do is we have to form a reaction where we go from elements in their standard state to one mole of that compound. And so enthalpy formation is the change in enthalpy for a reaction where we're forming one mole of that compound. And so if we do this reaction down of nitrogen plus hydrogen forming an ammonia, we actually should measure that it's exothermic and we're producing 46 or 46.11 kilojoules of heat is transferred from the system to the surroundings for every one mole of ammonia that is formed. Now for this reaction, the reactants are almost in their standard state. The coefficients from the product is one, and the coefficients from the reactants are set to balance the reaction. 
And so we have the a half in front of the N2, so we have one nitrogen atom on each side. We have the three halves in front of the H2, so we have three hydrogen atoms on each side. So we can go down this list, CO2, and so element center state would be carbon graphite plus O2. Again, you measure the heat um, going from the system surroundings to surrounding systems, and that actually is what's your delta H going to be. Carbon monoxide, carbon graphite plus one half O2 forms CO. And so all these are defined as elements in the standard state going to the one compound of interest, and they're all measured values. Now, one interesting question we can ask ourselves is, so we have one half H2 plus one half F2 forming HF. Again, you have to have one mole of that product, and we have a delta H for minus 271. And so obviously, if that delta H is negative, that means it has to be exothermic. And so we could also ask the question, how much heat would be produced if two moles of HF were produced? If you remember, when we talked about enthalpies before, that if you multiply the reaction by a number, you have to multiply delta H by the number. And so two moles of HF would actually produce 542.2 kilojoules of heat, or transfer 542 kilojoules of heat from the system to the surroundings. You could also be asked, what is more stable, H2 and F2, or HF? And again, what we're seeing is that we're converting chemical potential energy to heat energy, and so the HF must be more stable. Now this is a good approximation. You know, if we want to do it more ac accurately, we talk about free energy, but that will come later. And so for exothermic, you're going from reactants to products. The reactants have a higher enthalpy, and so that amount of heat produced is actually equal to that change in enthalpy going from the reactants to the products. Now we can actually use the enthalpies of formation to calculate the change enthalpy for any reaction. All we have to do is take the sum of the enthalpies of formation of the products minus the sum of the enthalpies of formation for the reactants. And so that capital sigma stands for sum um, and N delta H. And so if you have a coefficient, you have to multiply the coefficient times enthalpy of formation. And so if we look at a reaction, we have um, iron oxide plus aluminum going to iron metal plus aluminum oxide. We have the enthalpies of formation on top. Now, we can calculate the change enthalpy by doing products minus reactants. And so notice that we have two iron, and so we have to multiply the enthalpy formation of the iron by two, aluminum oxide, and then we have iron oxide, and then two aluminum. You should also recognize that iron solid is an element center state, so as enthalpy formation is zero. Aluminum metal, element center state, enthalpy formation is zero. And so we did the calculation, we get a delta H of minus 851.5 kilojoules. And so this is going to be fairly exothermic reaction. This is actually a fairly famous reaction. And so again, just to remind you, you have to multiply the enthalpies of formation by the coefficients of the reaction. And so another question we could ask is how much heat would be produced by a reaction of 1,000 grams of aluminum with excess iron oxide. And so we've already calculated delta H. And so now we go from 1,000 grams, convert that to moles, divided by 27 grams per mole, and then multiply it by our delta H and divide by two because in the reaction we have two moles of aluminum reacting and we get 15,800 kilojoules of heat. And so it's very exothermic. And I was mentioning this is a fairly um, famous reaction. It's a thermite reaction. It's actually been used in um, munitions. Also people have speculated that the reason that the Hindenburg went up so quickly was actually a thermite reaction, iron oxide was on the covering of the, of the Hindenburg. You had aluminum metal as the trusses, and so this is why the Hindenburg went up so quick. This is a car. It's been specially chosen to be destroyed because it's old, it's white, but more importantly, because it's French. The engine block is the densest part of the car. It's basically a huge lump of metal, and, well, it's very hard to melt. Lucky then, the Brainiacs have plenty of thermite specially packed into the slow release mechanism of a garden flower pot. A big pile on the bonnet directly over the engine block should do the trick. Time to light the fuse and give this homage to French engineering the send-off it so richly deserves. The irreversible thermite reaction begins. Within seconds, the fiery concoction eats through the bonnet, spraying molten thermite into the engine beneath. The devastation continues inside until finally a torrent of white-hot liquid metal pours out of the bottom. 
signaling the inevitable victory for thermite. But really cool, with the change in enthalpy, we can actually calculate how much heat was produced by that reaction. Chemistry is cool.